Okay, so let's get started. Um, the title of my presentation is The New Era of Gravitational Wave Astronomy. Uh, as was just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, that the gravitational waves were discovered in 2015. And just to give you a context, uh, yes, I mean, it was indeed the prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity, which he predicted almost a century ago. And for a long time, uh, essentially, though there was a prediction, but there was no conclusive, uh, conclusive evidence uh, or discovery uh, till almost like a century uh, after the, you know, after the uh, prediction of the theory, uh, from the theory. So uh, it was all exciting for all of us. Uh, and this was indeed a first uh, discovery which happened in 2015 and subsequently a new era of astronomy began mm -hmm. uh, and now we are almost seven years after the discovery and i'm just going to share with you how the entire journey uh, you know of this discovery uh, began uh, how it was sort of pioneered uh, how it evolved and where we are right now okay so i'll try to sort of share my excitement and try to uh, communicate with you uh, what we did for the past seven years and maybe before that. All right. So the the yeah it the the main foundation of Einstein's general theory of relativity is in this old experiment by Galileo Galilei, which all of us are familiar with, and which we have learned in our textbooks that uh, uh, Galileo was uh, basically was trying to uh, drop. Uh, you know, different uh, balls of different sizes, different material from the Tower of Pisa. And what he noticed that both the balls essentially arrive at the same time, irrespective of their mass, irrespective of their material and so on and so forth. It was considered as a very important experiment. And of course, it, he carried this out for a long time and which, and almost like, in this belief that how is it possible that you know that both the balls can fall um, exactly at the same time. And here, essentially, this uh, experiment lays down the foundation of the equivalence principle, which later on uh, was proposed uh, by Einstein. Of course, before that also comes Newton, uh, where we know Newton's law of gravity which essentially says that uh, you know, the force, the gravitational force between the, any two objects is proportional to the product of the masses and it's inversely proportional to the distance between, square of the distance between the two. And this essentially tells you that if you try to equate this to the Newton's second law, so namely you ask a question that, okay, under this force, how the objects are moving, then we equate this force to the mass times acceleration. And then you see that that mass essentially cancels this mass. And as a result, independent of the object's mass, okay, if they are acted upon by, let's say, uh, same uh, uh, bigger mass. So for example, if you have Earth and let's say if you have two objects, but of different masses, then they will experience the same acceleration. And this indeed, sort of uh, proves uh, what Galilean, uh, Galilee essentially found from his experiment. And Newton's laws essentially was uh, perfect in a sense that we saw that all the planets were following uh, Newton's uh, law of gravitation. As a result, we could explain the motions of the planets and uh, and also the you know motions of objects near the surface of the earth except the only exception was mercury's motion so for example everything was all the planets were nicely following newton's law except that the mercury was essentially was not coming back to its original position uh, there was a small displacement in his orbit and for a long time people wondered that why this is happening. They try to account for that using, uh, you know, the uh, maybe the effect of bigger objects like maybe Jupiter or Saturn and so on and so forth. But that 
you know that correction was not really accounted for so later on einstein came uh, in 1915 essentially he proposed general theory of relativity and it essentially gave a completely new picture of the way we look at gravity so so far in in newton's picture gravity is a force and which is given by the newton's law of uh newton's gravitational force uh, whereas what I, einstein said that um, the force is essentially uh, as given by newton is in some sense a small you know it's a small domain in which it works okay it only works when you have very weak gravity and if if the velocities of the objects are very very small in that case the bigger theory of gravity essentially goes to the newton's law of gravitation okay and why it works it works for our life or in everyday life because we are always working with very small velocities i mean very small as in small compared to velocity of light and we work in almost weak gravity regime okay and hence what we see is that all objects um, you know near the surface of the earth or even the planets they essentially follow newton's law of motion but what is the bigger picture the bigger picture is essentially if you have any big object then essentially it it there is a geometry around the object so you can consider uh, this is a big object for example sun okay and here this is sort of a imaginary fabric which we call it as a geometry and this sun essentially distorts the the geometry around it okay the way it is sort of depicted in this particular image so there is a distortion in the geometry just because of the presence of this object and you can imagine this distortion as a sort of a fabric so if you take sun a bigger let's say sun as a big ball and if you drop on some fabric then of course if the the fabric uh, or a sheet essentially it will get distorted because of the presence of this uh, ball and if you take a small ball on this sheet then depending upon how the distortion is this small ball will will move based on this distortion on this fabric and this is exactly so this is an analogy and you can apply pretty much uh, you know apply this analogy to earth and uh, sun system so if you have earth uh, sun here it essentially distorts the geometry around it and then imagine you have earth and the way earth moves around the sun is nothing but you can imagine as if uh, earth is moving on this fabric and the motion is what we observe the motion of the earth around the sun so essentially this was the you know uh, uh, the main crux of einstein's general theory of relativity and uh, now there is, there are more complexities which you can imagine that if you say that okay i have this object which is distorting this geometry so if if the if i move the object then of course the distortion is also going to move okay and that is exactly what happens so basically what he said is that you have matter which defines the geometry and the geometry is essentially decides the trajectory of the object and as a result einstein's theory of relativity becomes very complex theory you cannot uh, it is very non linear theory and it requires ad advanced mathematics to understand and explain and formulate this theory all right but the main essence is what just now i i sort of mentioned to you now if this is what happens then we can try to understand how what are gravitational waves or how how we can extend this picture of object distorting the the fabric or the space time around it so imagine if you have two objects then each of them will have its own geometry around it and as they move okay and so in this particular case imagine you have two objects which are bound 
and if, imagine if they start moving in an orbit around themselves then they will distort the matter uh, they distort the uh, the geometry around them in a very systematic way the way they move around a particular common center so for example i have this little video which can demonstrate to you so if you have these two objects as they move okay this geometry will get altered continuously and as a result this alteration which is in the form of their motion uh, which is in the form of their period of the motion okay that will get translated out outside as is shown here almost like a waves it's almost like as um, ma'am just now explained that is if you drop the uh, stone on the pond then it sort of produces uh, disturbance on the surface of the water so it's quite similarly you can treat this fabric as the surface of as a surface and as the two objects are moving then essentially this fabric essentially gets distorted systematically and this information is carried out in the form of waves and this is what we call it as gravitational waves and and this was his prediction long back and uh, of course uh, the prediction came out of his theory but when he did the estimation okay when he tried to estimate how much i mean how much is this distortion then einstein himself he, he thought that we will never discover it i mean we will never detect these gravitational waves because the the estimates were very tiny okay so i'll give you an example so before that i will just uh, tell you a little bit more about these waves so according to the theory these waves they travel with speed of light so that means their uh, yeah i mean their speed matches with the speed of light they are also transverse in nature that means the the distortions are essentially perpendicular to the direction of propagation and if there is any symmetry in an object uh, then it does not produce gravitational waves in fact if you have an object with which is asymmetric then that produces the gravitational waves okay uh, in fact i think those who are familiar with the uh, with uh, the symmetry concept then there is something called as a quadrupole moment in mathematics which can capture the essence of the symmetry spherical symmetry so if you have this and this is defined as q and if you have let's say a non zero time varying quadrupole moment then that essentially produces the gravitational wave so here h is denoted as something like a amplitude of the gravitational waves okay here r is basically the distance to the source and it essentially depends on the time varying nature of this quadrupole moment now now if uh, right so now let me just estimate so if this is now the question will come that okay i mean einstein uh, predicted uh, gravitational waves in in long back in 1915 then why did it take such a long time to really detect them okay so the reason is that these waves are extremely tiny so to just give you an example i have i have two examples here so one example is let's consider a a rod okay this is a rod okay i imagine the rod is spinning so i am just spinning this rod around this axis okay and if you have spinning rod then that will also produce gravitational waves because that is essentially the uh, the motion is uh not symmetric and it's also time vary so it is going to produce gravitational waves. so now i have put some numbers so imagine i have this rod in of of length let's say 10 meters and it's it's spinning with let's say 10 hertz okay so it is making let's say 10 cycles in one second and the mass is let's say 1000 kilometers it's quite massive rod now imagine i'm spinning this rod somewhere in us in in america and i am trying to observe what are what are, what is the uh, gravitational waves emitted from this rod sitting here in mumbai so if i do this and if i do a calculation then the number which i get is extremely tiny so it's a very tiny number okay 
and this is always compared with respect to one and hence i say it is tiny okay and this essentially tells you that this is very small compared to one which i cannot really measure it's a too tiny number so then we say okay fine i mean we cannot measure this because maybe the source is terrestrial it is not as heavy as you expect maybe the gravity is not very strong so i bring in some astrophysical sources astronomical sources so basically sources which are quite huge and they are very compact sources so imagine i take a system like i described earlier that is two objects in in an orbit and i take stars which are called as neutron stars so neutron stars are basically stars uh, they are final stages of the the stellar evolution that is when a sun or a, let's say a sun almost like eight times mass of the sun it, it goes to the its own life cycle then eventually it goes to various stages and imagine that if it finally becomes a neutron star so neutron star is essentially a star made up of neutrons and its uh, its typical radius is something like 10 kilometers so it's as small as you know pune a size of pune maybe and the mass is uh, almost one and a half times mass of our sun so imagine you have such a huge mass packed in the city of pune right so it has very strong gravity so imagine we have two stars like that and they are in this binary orbit and if i do again the same calculation then that essentially improves my number by almost 20 orders of magnitude i get a huge improvement in my estimation of the amplitude of gravitational waves so that essentially tells you that it is it is best to look for gravitational waves not from the terrestrial sources but maybe sources which are more massive more compact which has much stronger gravity and hence something which is astronomical in the astronomical scale now okay so now if, if this is the typical amplitude now we will ask a question okay so how does it affect so imagine if the gravitational waves are incident then what happens okay so i have a little video which will sort of tell you what exactly happens so imagine i have a cylinder and imagine the gravitational waves are propagating in this direction okay so if it is propagating in this direction and if i have this cylinder made up of this tiny particles okay then the waves essentially will distort this cylinder the way i am showing you in this video so it will sort of it, this the circular part will become like an ellipse in one side and then after you know after in the second uh, half it will go an elongated ellipse in the other in the perpendicular direction and that will keep on happening as the waves are passing by so essentially it produces strains in in the object in the masses because it changes the distance between the two masses so the gravitational waves as they propagate they essentially change the distance between the two masses and this is what is sort of used when we build the detectors to detect gravitational waves all right so now let's let's uh, before we sort of move ahead i just want to give you a picture of how our universe is just to get some rough idea of the you know different objects so imagine you have we always measure things in terms of light years so light years is typically a distance traveled by the light in one year okay and so you have so if you measure in terms of this particular unit then the solar system is roughly 10 to the power minus 4 light years as you go to the next thing let's say our nearby stars these are roughly 100 light years and then you have milky way which is something like 10 to the power 5 light years then you have nearby galaxies and then you have galaxy clusters and then you have bigger clusters and so on and so forth so this is a typical way you know the way we sort of uh, try to uh, understand uh, the distances the sizes so the unit which we use is light years because that is something which captures you know the the unit the basic unit itself is quite huge 
and that helps us to sort of capture the astronomical distances which we talk about all right all right so now if that is the case then the question is that okay now the the picture is clear that we know how the gravitational waves are produced we know roughly how to detect them now the question is what kind of sources we expect uh, which will produce measurable or detectable gravitational waves so there are large number of sources in our universe so i have just taken few examples here but there are many more sources uh, uh, we have so first is basically if you have two stars in the binary orbit as i have described so in our galaxy there would be stars which are in the binary orbits and they they would produce gravitational waves similarly in the other galaxies we can have systems where you have two stars uh they are not very compact that they are going around each other but maybe one is made up of some gas and then you have another which is more compact and it is trying to you know accrete matter from the bigger from this gaseous uh, object to the other and this is what we call it as a accreting system so it is there is accretion happening from there is a mass is getting transferred onto this and that will also produce gravitational waves now imagine if we have two galaxies um, which are sort of merging into each other so there are people have observed now uh, galaxies merger uh, merging galaxies as sort of images we also know that the our nearby galaxy the galaxy which is andromeda is actually approaching us so eventually it might merge so basically if you have this merging galaxies then the centers of these galaxies will have very massive black holes and then they can form a system like this and you they can emit gravitational waves imagine our universe is very vast and even if when we are talking about the time scales of you know merging of this merging sort of phenomena uh, the, though the time scales are huge if you sort of probe with your telescopes much deeper then you have higher chances of observing at least some of these events uh, somewhere in the universe provided you are you have you know more more sensitive instruments similarly let's say you have a star um, maybe like our sun or maybe 10 times the mass of the sun which is eventually uses its fuel and then it explodes um, and this is called a supernova explosion and that also can produce gravitation so there are various there is a large collection of sources which we expect that the universe uh, will offer to us uh, to detect uh, gravitation waves from them so the first detection i mean it would be unfair not to talk about professor joseph weber who essentially was has pioneered the uh, you know the the detection of gravitational waves so he had this idea so, uh, so this happened in 1965 where he proposed that okay why not use metal bars um, to detect gravitational waves and the idea is that if you have a incoming gravitational waves and imagine if the frequency of this metal detector is sort of uh, you know resonant with the incoming gravitational wave frequency then there will be some kind of a resonance and because of which it will show uh, the bar will show some excitement uh, exciting uh, sort of uh, feature which can be captured and and hence one can sort of uh, you know uh, claim that there is a detection now this is a very historical uh, mm, uh, incident which actually was uh, you know was very important for the for the gravitational wave uh, mm, i mean the whole field itself so professor weber um, so he designed this in university of maryland and he announced in 1968 that with his bar he detected gravitational waves so there is a paper in physical Re review letters you can you can see this and and this created lot of excitement um, because according to einstein's theory though there was a prediction since the numbers were the the values of this amplitude were so tiny 
I mean, nobody really went ahead and tried to design things to detect gravitational waves. However, um, Professor Weber, because of, I mean, he designed this bar and he was taking uh, continuous readings and he found some uh, evidence and he sort of announced that he detected gravitational waves. And that created so much excitement that there were so many resonant bar detectors were built all over the globe. I mean, there were resonant bars in MIT, in IBM. I, IBM had a resonant bar um, in, in University of Glasgow, Germany, Italy. I mean, there are many places um, uh, resonant bar detectors were built just to check whether the claim which he made uh, is, is valid or not. And later on, it turned out that there was some instrumental uh, uh, sort of artifact, which is what he saw. And um, those, though the claim was not valid, essentially this incident marked the beginning of the hunt of gravitational waves. And hence, one needs to sort of uh, mention this and we need to remember uh, him uh, through uh, his journey. So the, the, the main sort of, after that, mm, uh, uh, there was another uh, uh, professor, this uh, Felix Pirani. In 1957, he had this new idea that if you use a light signal, which can be used to measure the distance between the two free test masses. So you can use this. And this was the main idea, which was sort of picked up uh, by uh, uh, Reiner Weiss. And in and in fact, when he proposed this idea in a conference, uh, Reiner Weiss was a young uh, student. And subsequently, um, uh, based on this idea, he developed. And of course, he did a lot of sort of uh, work uh, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to assess uh, or test the feasibility of such an idea in using the laser interferometry, uh, laser interferometers. So this is essentially the is the first uh, proposal uh, of laser interferometry gravitational observatory or what we call it as LIGO now. And this proposal was submitted in 1989 uh, to National Science Foundation uh, to build such an uh, instrument. So you can see uh, the names here, uh, Kip Thorne, Reiner Weiss, uh, Ronald Drever, so all the three members uh, we just heard. Uh, who were the main guy, uh, people who, who received the, you know, uh, the breakthrough prize and, uh, and Frederick uh, Rab. All right. So, of course, a little bit history after that. So, so after the uh, discovery uh, in 1961, as I mentioned to you, Joe Weber proposed the resonant bar detector. And then there was this... Uh, uh, big sort of uh, phase where the development of precision measurement, laser technology, as well as feasibility study of uh, doing this long arm uh, length interferometer. And uh, you have to try to, uh, you know, uh, figure it out. What are the possible noise sources, which one can work it around to reach that particular uh, strain sensitivity, which uh, which we were talking about. So that all was done in 70s. Uh, parallelly, there were a lot of prototype interferometers, which were like small uh, interferometers, uh, were built all over the world. They were in Glasgow, Garshing, in MIT. And, uh, and then in 1992, uh, the proposal was approved by National Science Foundation. Uh, and they sort of uh, 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 gave green signal to start and build the, the detector. Uh, now, parallelly, uh, so there was, uh, and then of course, in, from 1994 onwards, there was the LIGO uh, construction started. Uh, LIGO scientific collaboration was established in 1997, where uh, people realized that it is not, I mean, this discovery is not something which one can do uh, with a small group of people because you need people of different expertise. Uh, so you need engineers, you need scientists, you need mathematicians, people who know how to 
design this uh, signals from uh, from the astrophysical sources and also you need uh, people who can sort of detect these signals into uh, which are buried deep in the noisy data so i think this was quite wise that ligo realized that this is not something which they can do alone and hence they decided to open up uh, the ligo and form the ligo scientific collaboration and this was a very wise and i would say it's something which uh, which i mean the thinking uh, behind this that this is something going to be a big science and you need a lot of expertise all over the globe and that was that was really an important move because uh, from 1997 till the discovery which happened in 2015 the collaboration built uh, by the time it was discovered we were almost close to 16 uh, uh, 16 17 countries working towards this and people from different backgrounds with different expertise uh, who all contributed to this discovery all right so um, this is a little bit brief about the historical sort of Uh, uh, development for the whole century how things progressed now let's come back to the science so so what exactly happened so here i have a little video so imagine you have a laser interferometer so this is the basic layout of a laser interferometer you have a uh, laser there's a beam splitter the the light goes in uh, these two different arms so these are the two mirrors the light would get reflected and then it will get combined and you collect it in the photo photo detector so i'm just going to play a little video which shows how uh, when the gravitation waves are incident how there would be changes in the arm length and how you sort of detect uh, the gravitation waves so you can see the laser beam which is getting reflected and then you collect now imagine that there is a gravitation waves then your mirrors will move the way they um, i have just shown and as a result when you go uh, so here is just a zoom of the laser beam getting reflected and then finally uh, the beams from both side they combine and then you see the uh, the the interference uh, in terms of the intensity you sense at the photodiode so as, as the gravitation waves are incident you will see that these two mirrors will get uh, Uh, there will be a strain or change in arm length and which you can sort of see in terms of the change in the intensity and which is what you essentially you are going to measure so that's the basic idea of ligo uh, laser interferometer gravitational wave uh, observatory and and that's what we sort of uh, try aim to uh, detect of course this looks very simple uh but the actual design is not that as simple as this because when we talk about this uh, michelson con configuration uh we are keeping everything on the on the table uh where you will have seismic sort of shaking you know people walking by there are vehicles and things like that that will affect the interferometer but the actual ligo is not kept as it is essentially all the optics is uh is suspended and when you have suspended optics it's very difficult and very challenging to to control the motion of the optics um also uh since the, the strain also depends or the change in length depends on the arm length uh essentially there is a there is a cavity is put inside which reflects the beam multiple times so this is a picture of Uh, two ligo so you can see here this is there is one ligo instrument is in Li livingston um louisiana uh, stay uh, this thing and the other one is in hanford this is in washington state so you can see the two instruments are located uh, almost uh, uh, yeah they are separated by almost 3000 kilometers uh, in us and uh, and and this is actual sort of uh, design so there is a fabry pero cavity here and this the arm length of each interferometer is close to 4 km so in addition to just reflection there is a multiple reflection because of this cavity and as a result you increase the effective arm length and uh, which is useful when you detect 
the ground tissue analysis. All right. So, what is an advanced LIGO detector? It's actually it's a, it's an amazing instrument. It's an engineering and technological marvel. It has two inter interferometers with four kilometer vacuum chambers, three thousand kilometers apart. They are operating in unison, and to measure the motion of almost ten thousand times smaller than the atomic nucleus, which is caused due to the violent event in the universe located at billions and uh, uh, millions of light years away. Uh, so it's 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 amazing. Uh, feat that the humans have, uh, have achieved and um, and the i mean it was extremely challenging journey because i have witnessed some of the uh, difficulties which were faced uh, in order to achieve uh, that particular sensitivity which we were try, trying to achieve so so once the the all this commissioning and everything was done then in 2015 um, when the detectors were ready to sort of uh, start operating and doing the observation run uh, that's where uh, in 2015 november 14 uh, we discovered this first event uh, so here I, let me just explain what is this so on the x axis is the time and on the y axis is the frequency uh, and if you look at this this is essentially the time series so uh, it just uh, how the signal is okay um, as a function of time but this image is essentially is the is the time frequency representation of the data so what it tells you is wherever you see the bright spot that essentially tells you that is a place where uh, the energy of the signal is maximum and that is captured in the time and what is the corresponding frequency uh, for that particular signal okay and what we saw was that you have we observed this event which was quite similar in its morphology uh, in two detectors separated by just a few milliseconds and uh, upon investigation essentially we we uh, we concluded that this was nothing but uh, a binary, it's a binary, it's a, it's a gravitational waves emitted by a binary system, like exactly like what I explained to you earlier, that two objects in a binary system. So this is a, a simulation of this system. And as they move, they come, they emit gravitational waves, they come close to each other and they increase their frequency. And finally, they merge into a single object and this final object essentially essentially is trying to settle and that is what you see here this settling signature and this is a signal which we we found in the or we detected in the ligo data so so this was the first event uh, it was quite remarkable um, sort of moment uh, and we went ahead and we tried to estimate what are the masses where the distance, where the event took place. And it turned out, just to give you a perspective, um, uh, I mean, this event came from a quite far distant history. And that historical sort of moment corresponds if you try to map it to what happened um, on Earth during that time. So it were, we were somewhere here, um, okay, where the multicellular organism life was just getting formed. And uh, around that time, from the distant universe, uh, this merger event took place and it traveled from there all the way to us uh, in, and arrived on these two detectors in, in 2015. So, uh, so it is quite remarkable because the LIGO uh, detectors achieved that sensitivity which, they, which uh, we were planning to sort of uh, detect and hence it took a, such a long time. So what was the event? So it was a collision of two black holes, um, almost very massive black holes. So almost like 30 times mass of our sun. And they were located very far away. So it was like 1400 light years. So almost the event was sitting somewhere in uh, almost at the cosmological uh, distances 
somewhere in the clusters of galaxies which are looking which are at the distance of 1400 light years and the amount of energy it emitted in that collision is almost like if you take our sun and imagine if the sun explodes then it will be huge amount of energy uh, so almost three times of that uh, if you want to sort of map it to what we uh, receive from or uh, from the sun every day then it is this much times uh, that of the sun's emission which we receive every day so it was a huge amount of energy which was released in a very short time uh, in this collision uh, of course this was a really spectacular thing and uh, the three pioneers they received the nobel prize in physics in 2017 this was one of the fastest nobel prize uh, uh, received in physics for their contribution for their contributions to the ligo and the observation of gravitational waves this discovery was uh, unique in several ways so it was not only it was the first direct detection of gravitational waves uh, it was also the first time uh, astronomers actually observed uh, black holes in a binary system uh, it's the first time they observed the collision of black holes uh directly and also there is there is something which we learned uh, which was also the first time that we never knew that there are black holes which are you know above some 20 solar mass or something like that i mean both the systems were 30 times the mass of the sun and this was something which was not known to the black holes now black holes are objects where as we know that the even the light cannot uh you know they cannot because everything gets uh, sort of gobbled up so when the light cannot uh, escape from them now if the light cannot escape uh, of course we cannot see we cannot observe them and as a result probing black holes is always a challenge has always been a challenge and it was very challenging to probe black holes in you know in any conventional astronomy which involves light in terms of optical or radio or x rays gamma rays and things like that so this discovery opened a completely new uh, window to our universe because there is a way we could now detect black holes which was otherwise was not which was very challenging and in fact that was the reason why we could not really detect very massive black holes uh, because uh, in conventional astronomy there was no way we could sort of probe those systems all right so um, so just to give a little bit of, of a picture of uh, what black holes the different types of black holes uh, can i just ask how much time i have okay uh hello mummy you can continue i can continue right? okay thanks a lot um all right so uh, basically the black holes are formed when you have very massive stars like uh, not like our sun because our sun when it will go through its life cycle it's not going to form a black hole but if you have let's say uh, masses almost 10 times or even more than mass of our sun then eventually when it goes through its life cycle then you form uh, compact objects like either neutron star or black hole now there are different types of black holes uh, just based on the um, based on the masses so what we call it as a stellar mass black holes which are black holes which with mass less than 100 times mass of our sun and that is what people have observed in the conventional astronomy because if you have let's say as i was mentioning earlier that if you have a black hole and let's say if there is some other object is trying to accrete the mass onto it then because of this interaction it essentially emits uh, some light in x ray and that is what we can observe and that is how people have been observing black holes so essentially you you can observe stellar mass black hole we could observe uh, stellar mass black hole in the x ray but 
there is a limitation as i mentioned to you earlier i mean you cannot observe let's say if you have two binary systems or two objects which are in the binary orbit because there is no light which comes from them then you have another class of black holes which are supermassive black holes which are like very huge black holes which are sitting at the centers of our galaxy so for example the center of our galaxy there is there is a huge uh, supermassive black holes and recently in fact the 2020 nobel prize in physics was awarded for the for for the uh, estimation of this uh, uh, the mass of the supermassive black holes uh, and essentially what they did was uh, they sort of tried to map the orbit of a of a uh, of a star uh, around this around the center and using that orbit they could sort of predict that what is the mass what is the mass of the supermassive black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy so most of these galaxies like ours uh, they harbor this supermassive black hole and these supermassive black holes are, are you can treat them like a engine for the for this the motion of the uh, the entire galaxy because when you take a galaxy there are stars which are moving around this the center uh, so there is a lot of activity is happening and the center central supermassive black hole is sort of acts like an engine it also try it also holds the galaxy together and then you have something called as intermediate mass black holes which are neither supermassive nor stellar mass nor very small black holes nor very huge black holes and it's very difficult to detect these black holes uh because uh, you cannot detect them by mapping stars um and it has been quite i mean these sources have been quite elusive nevertheless they are very interesting uh systems because they are sort of they are considered as a, they are sort of seeds of the supermassive black holes i mean so far there are all, we have many puzzles in astronomy for example we don't know how the galaxies are formed we don't know how the supermassive black holes at the centers of the galaxies are formed and we expect that as you observe more and more such systems we will sort of learn about these puzzles and i think intermediate mass black holes are one of the key to this puzzle because people think that you can have uh, you know the intermediate mass black hole can merge with some other black holes and form bigger black hole and that can merge to some with something else and form bigger and so on so forth so there are theories but we do not have direct evidence and we expect that the gravitational wave astronomy as we observe more and more systems we will sort of get uh, clues to these puzzles uh, okay so now so far uh, the detectors which we have we have two ligo detectors uh, there is one european detector in fact there are two european detectors the one is in germany it is called a geo 600 it's a smaller detector it's essentially used for uh, research and development of of ligo and then there is another detector which is virgo which is in italy it's actually uh, out, uh, it's it's sitting in the outskirts of pisa and this is quite similar uh, length it's 3 km arm length uh, like ligo and uh, now all the three detectors two ligo detectors in us and one in italy they are uh, taking data and they are working together uh, there is one detector in japan is uh, is getting sort of ready for to join uh, the trio um, so this is the this is called as kagra and then we have uh, the indian detector which is ligo india which is supposed to be basically the third ligo but located in india and uh, this is uh, i mean we are waiting to get the final sort of approval uh, of the project mm, already the uh, the site has been um, uh, uh, has been finalized and the land has been acquired and so on so we ex i mean we expect the it sort of gets approved then the you know the the all the activity can get started all right so what is the story so far so after the first discovery uh, there was uh, you know, we had several observation runs and with each observation run so in fact we had three observation runs so which is o1 o2 and o3 this was one of the longest observation run almost for a year 
and the number of events which we discovered they sort of multiplied amazingly so you can see this uh, this is essentially the cumulative number of detections so as of now we have detected almost close to 90 uh, compact binary mergers and this is the sort of the final okay so this is the final one so here each line which i have shown here they are basically two compact objects merging into a final object so and this is on this axis is the solar mass so you can see we have seen a large spectrum of compact binaries majority of them are essentially black hole black hole systems merging and making a bigger black hole in fact we have seen a black hole which is almost the final mass is very close to 140 solar mass so i mean this is something which is extremely encouraging it also tells us that as you improve your detectors more and more we expect to see many more such systems and as a result we will try to probe things which were not really probed earlier namely what is the black hole population in our universe and uh, you know the how the population is how they are distributed what are their masses how they are formed and there are very qu many questions which we'll try to uh, address now in the last few minutes i would like to stress on two more discoveries which were uh, which were quite unique and uh, the unique as far as astronomy is concerned it sort of you know opened up new ideas and uh, or sort of unraveled uh, i mean long puzzles one of the discovery was the discovery of a binary neutron star so what we saw is we, we didn't observe just the black hole black hole system but we also observed black neutron star neutron star system and this was a spectacular discovery because this sort of opened up another sort of uh, uh, window in in astronomy so i will just sort of narrate what what we observe so in 17th uh, october 2017 uh, we observed another event okay so you can see this streak long streak so this is a binary neutron star merger event and immediately uh, two seconds later we observed um, uh, a gamma ray burst in this fermi satellite and this was unique because uh, for a long time people have been observing this gamma ray burst in the gamma ray window and and people had no idea what is what are the what is what is what is, what is their progenitor okay, how they are formed basically and this was a sort of known puzzle in astronomy for a long time that there are short gamma ray bursts which are essentially a, a gamma ray burst is like a very copious um, event highly energetic it emits almost like 10 to 53 ergs in few seconds it's, it's short very ultra relativistic uh, you know massive kind of explosion uh, and in a short time and and we have no idea what was the progenitor and this was the first time uh, when we observed this joint observation with ligo and with fermi it sort of nailed down to the fact that the short gamma ray burst um, they are essentially the result of binary neutron star merger event which sort of triggers this short gamma ray burst so this essentially opened up a completely new way of looking at things because this was the first multi messenger astronomy event where the one messenger is the gravitational wave uh, which is quite different than the electromagnetic wave and they essentially talk to each other and using this there is a huge amount of science uh, we uh, we learned we learned a lot about how the gamma ray burst people are uh, investigating how about the gamma ray burst models and then uh, and then how they are formed uh, i mean it it also uh, sort of uh, told us more about uh, how the uh, you know the uh, heavier elements are formed because this is one of the source of uh, this uh, r process uh, nucleosynthesis where you higher and higher elements are formed in our universe 
and the other event which was the discovery of the intermediate mass black hole uh, merger event which was quite unique because this was the first time uh, conclusively we uh, we detected an intermediate mass black hole system uh, which was a merger of these two very massive black holes into a single black hole and this also sort of uh, started uh, very new ideas because people are starting to wonder how the black holes are formed uh, you know are they formed because there are you know for example this is too high uh, mass for the black hole so people are wondering whether is this a sort of second generation black hole that there might be uh, another merger because of which uh, you know the final product is this uh, black hole and then it has merged with this and forming this so is there any hierarchy of black hole merger events <laughs> so um, so with that uh, i sort of uh, take you to the future uh, so first is i mean the gravitational wave astronomy is just very young astronomy and even in this seven years we have learned a lot about uh, our universe and we we hope to learn more because we are going to start our next observation run uh, in in few months time and we expect to observe many more uh, systems uh, future there are already uh, sort of approved uh, projects uh, so one is einstein telescope which is a third generation uh, gravitational wave detector uh, and then uh, there is also a, a sort of uh, next space mission where you will have the interferometric detector in space and which will observe in a completely different window and with this we expect to sort of scan a uh, multi frequency uh, gravitational wave observations uh, of a variety of sources so i think with that so we have lots of questions uh, we expect to address some of these like how about black holes about the formation of this compact objects about our cosmology our universe and i think with that i will stop here thanks a lot uh, for your attention i have actually i have few links here if there are students uh, we we do lot of outreach the gravitational wave community is very Uh, pro, uh, proactive in doing science outreach so we have this gravitation wave open science uh, page where there are tutorials there are lectures videos there are also games and uh, i think people can go and have a look at it and with that thanks a lot thank you so much ma'am uh if there are any questions i invite the audience to personally address them to ma'am uh professor uh, arjuna pai lalita dhareshwar here just uh, wanted uh, see the uh, arms of the interferometer they are so huge i mean so long yes. it is uh, of the order of how many kilometers they are maybe 4 kilometers 4 kilometers how yes. do you manage to keep the uh these uh, uh you know the 